could just say one take one. Oh, I like this. I like right this there. bit. Which camera? That camera right over there. We'll do I have to do a clap? If that's all right. Yeah. Ready? Yep. One take, one mark. I read your book, start of 2007. Oh, okay. It was in the top, it was in the first five books of non-fiction. Not that I'd ever read any fiction, I haven't read anything. So Think and Grow Rich, Rich Dad Poor Dad, your book, probably in the first five. Oh. Loved the book. Oh, thank you. I wasn't ready for it because I was skinned, but <laughs> yeah. So I didn't really know exactly where it would go. And I, starting out, I thought there would be more um, sort of financial, um, you know, even hanky-panky. <laughs> uh, and there was a little bit of that in the book. But I really um, developed a tremendous respect for all of the men in, in the book. Uh, you know, but, um, uh, you know, they all had, I think, uh, you know, worked very hard. Had, you know, and the qualities I talked about, it was, it was really... So, you know, a lot to admire about them. So, um, um, you know, having been in the financial world, I think I sort of assumed that that was a bigger part of it. But mm. uh, really, you know, they, they by and large, uh, you know, created enterprises and uh, managed to hold on to the equity of them and, yeah. you know, really built something. Um, and... Um, so, uh, so, it, so it was interesting that the, but I didn't even have the title when I started. And really, yeah, I, and I had a working title, and then at one point the Can you uh, what that was uh, was uh, Cash of the Titans. Was oh, that. nice! <laughs> um, <laughs> I like that. Uh, um, and uh, but sort of as I was, you know, well into it, the woman who was uh, uh, you know, handling it for the publisher sort of the coordinator for it um called me she said well you know we're not sure about the title why don't you give us so i came up with a list of other possible titles and how to be a billionaire was almost a throwaway to me because i thought it was a little fanciful but as soon as i said she said that's the one that's right yeah and you know i realized that it really was a great title because you don't have to explain yeah. what the book's about you know and people you know get mm. it right away you know mm. and um so um, there's a lot to be said for calling something what it is. A lot of good books, the, the book is just like Arnold Schwarzenegger's autobiography was Total Recall, which is the name of one of his films. Just very clear, concise. Uh -huh. Yeah. Tim Ferriss just launched Tools of Titans, didn't he? Uh -huh. That is what his book is. Yeah, Sometimes absolutely. we can get a bit clever for our own good, can't we, with titles of books? Yeah. Well, one of my others, uh, I, I also... Uh, it's the, you know they, the pu same publisher said you know we're going to call it financial statement analysis. I said well, that's that's pretty straightforward. <laughs> and I said you know it, it seemed um, unexciting to me because my my idea was behind the balance sheet. You know, so, uh, but they mm. said no, we, we want to make it marketable to the college audience. And right. so if you have too a gimmicky kind of title, that really won't work there. Um, but I think they were right again on that uh, because you know the books now. I'm working on a fifth edition of it, um, so you know, it's clearly been successful. Mm. And in the professional market, which I really had thought of more than the college market, but um, but both, uh, uh, it's been been uh, a good seller in both. And um, so I've found that publishers really are, are worthwhile. I think authors sort of have ideas about things, but they really need the guidance of a publisher mm. to help them sort of refine the idea and make it something that's uh, commercial as well as something, you know, I mean, I've always had fun writing the books, but uh, you want, you know, you want to reach a large audience, you know, even aside from making the money off, you'd like to have the, see that impact yeah. of the book. And this book, um, unquestionably, I had, I, um, I was at a conference speaking on a totally different subject, but this man came up and he says, this is my son who made about 12 and so on. And, you know, he's read your book and this is his mm. goal. And I said, you know, I am very sure that, uh, you know, someone and more than one person who reads the book will become a billionaire. Um, you know, not entirely because of the roadmap yeah. <laughs> in the book, <clears throat> you know, they have to have a lot, you know, the qualities of determination and, mm. you know, to do it. But I, I think that uh, there are some ideas. One of the um, endorsers of the book was a, uh, someone I knew, uh, uh, Spencer Hayes, who had, um, 
I guess most of his money had been made in the textile and apparel business, but I knew him from, uh, he was the president of the company I worked for, selling door to door in the summertime during college. And he um, uh, wound up donating his $300 million art collection to the Musée d'Orsay in Paris and got some publicity. Otherwise, I don't think he was all that well known, but then he wasn't someone who was seeking publicity or anything. But he, he was kind enough to say that, uh, you know, gee, I wish I had had this book when I was starting out. And I took that as really the highest compliment I think I got. Mm. Uh, may, maybe on any book that I've written to say, well, yeah, the, um, here's someone who had, had been very successful and said that, yeah, this would have been helpful to me. Because that was one of the, the things that stood out in the uh, early billionaires. They mm. didn't do it overnight. I mean, yeah, of course. It took them a long time. And I think mm. that if it uh, if some of the ideas in the book help to accelerate that for uh, the uh, rising billionaires. Uh, that's, uh, that's terrific. Yeah, great. Should we sit down? Yeah, sure. Great. Thanks for getting the water, Harry. Uh, is it better you, on one side or the other? Or do you want, I guess because I've got the okay. iP- iPad okay. there. Okay, good. Cheers, Marty. Oh, Thanks yeah. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, this is the longest Uber drive I've ever been in. Hour and ten minutes, nearly really? 100, nearly a hundred quid in an Uber. That's not how to be a billionaire. Oh yeah, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to. <laughs> oh no, no worries. I don't mind. I, I like these travels. Mm. I did a couple of calls in the car. I was on my laptop. I like coming to wherever you are to do these interviews. It's yeah. Well, it's just our, our daughter lives here, and we feel like we're sort of on call. She has a newborn, actually, mm. <clears throat> so I just didn't want to stray too far and you know uh, not be available. Yeah. So. No, that's great. Marty, thanks a lot for coming on the podcast. Terrific to be here. Can I just set the scene? Um, I was really pleased when you responded when I reached out uh, because in the first five non-fiction, what you might deem personal development or life-changing books that I read, I think maybe the third or fourth was your How to Be a Billionaire. Um, I remember it was a big, beefy book, and that was scary to me, <laughs> having just got through Rich Dad, Poor Dad and then moved on to Think and Grow Rich, you mm-hmm. know, working up to your book. Yeah. It was it had a gold cover. Yeah. Um, even your name, I mean, it was Martin, not Marty on your book. <laughs> Martin Fridson, that sounded so regal. And um, I just remember getting so much out of the book, and I was in debt at the time. So, it, you know, it was sort of like, wow, look how big this world is. So to sit here and talk to you is a privilege for me as well. So, so thank you for that. So um, I'm fascinated by billionaires. I love watching all the autobiographical documentaries. There's been a few films that have come out on Warren Buffett and Getty, where he was painted quite badly. Uh, but most people don't really know what billionaires are like or the commonalities. And so as society, we often judge them, don't we, as maybe being a bit greedy or power hungry. But you're obviously in a position better than most because you've done a huge amount of research and you've written a book on the subject. So the question I've always wanted to ask my whole life to someone is this. What does a billionaire know that a millionaire doesn't yet know? Well, I think that... uh Knowing that it's possible, I, I think they uh, have a belief in themselves that they can achieve this. Uh, you know, it's typical, uh, at least some of the billionaires have said, oh, I never really set out to make a lot of money. I just enjoyed what I was doing. And uh, there may be such a case, but I think they were driven by the money, at least as um, a goal, if not necessarily for the enjoyment of the wealth itself, but as an achievement uh, mm. to get to that kind of a level. And um, I think that uh, most of us don't realize it is actually possible to achieve such a thing. It, it seems so extraordinary, so far beyond the imagination uh, that, uh, you know, really understanding that it is possible uh, to achieve that, I think, is the most significant difference. Mm. Uh, most people don't set out to do that, and I don't think everyone should. Uh, it's not the most balanced life, you might say, there, uh, although uh, some of the billionaires have uh, achieved in other fields and uh, have uh, certainly enjoyed uh, leisure activities. Uh, but you have to be pretty um, focused, mm. <laughs> I was extremely focused, to achieve anything like a billion dollars of net worth. So when you say not always balanced, do you mean there's attrition in other areas of their life or just because they've been so single-minded, they've not really done anything else? Uh, 
Well, I, again, there's some variation in that, but to give you an example, Sam Walton's family said that when they went on a family vacation, he would spend most of his time at other stores. This was the founder of the Walmart. Uh, <laughs> Which I'm enough about that. Yeah. Yeah. And he would go into other stores and uh, copy what they were doing. He was very proud of that he had not uh, originated any idea. Mm -hmm. He just copied from others and uh, did this obsessively and uh, genuinely enjoyed it. I don't think there's any question that the uh, billionaires liked what they were doing, something that might seem onerous or a chore to many of us. And many of us would say, well, uh, I'm making a good living. I'm happy when the workday is over. I can go home and spend the time with my family and or enjoy other pursuits. Uh, and again, it's not that they were uh, completely one dimensional, but no question that what came first was the focus on business, building an enterprise, uh, figuring out how to capitalize on that, uh, expand their wealth more, even after they got to a point where they were uh, quite comfortable. Mm. Um, Kirk Kerkorian, who uh, made uh, fortunes in uh, the entertainment business uh, uh, and uh, a variety of ventures, uh, got to the point where he had sold a business and uh, was worth $100 million at a time when it would be, it'd be equivalent to a billion nowadays. Um, said, well, what am I going to do now? Just sit around? I, I, so he wanted to make more, and he bet the whole thing. He came very close to going bust completely several more times during his career, but that was what drove him, uh, what kept him motivated. So certainly he got to the point where he had more money than he could possibly spend. Now, some of the billionaires then turned to philanthropy as a uh, way to d make use of that wealth that they've created. Uh, that's uh, quite a common uh, characteristic as well. Mm. So that one, I think, is I interesting to explore. And uh, I've got like, about six questions buzzing around <laughs> my head at the moment. But let's go straight in with that philanthropy one. Um, because I think I certainly see a lot um, where people haven't been surrounded by wealth or maybe they've had a, an upbringing that doesn't really appreciate money for the, the positives, mm -hmm. assume that uh, many billionaires or very w wealthy people take from the poor or, you know, like because they've made money, it's at the cost of other people. Every billionaire I've ever studied, I've probably interviewed four, maybe five on my podcast, is a big philanthropist. Now, um, it, according to my research, some of them didn't intend to be, society almost forced them to be by saying, hey, wait a minute, Bill Gates, stop <laughs> testing your um, software on us and start doing something good with your money. Um, but of course, look how that's changed him for the great of mankind. Of course, many of these big philanthropists now are, they are progressing humanity, you know, like a Richard Branson and Elon Musk taking us to other planets. What's your research say on um, whether they've been greedy or overly capitalist? capitalizing on the poor versus actually being pretty generous and philanthropic? Well, it's a very interesting question. Now, philanthropy is not uncontroversial in itself. There are those who say, oh, well, they're looking to salve their conscience after having done all these awful things to make these fortunes. And shouldn't the government really be taking care of people? Shouldn't the billionaires be taxed at uh, very high levels so that there wouldn't be a need? And doesn't that uh, make people beholden to these private individuals rather than uh, benefiting from the uh, community at large? And those are uh, not um, inconsequential questions. Uh, they're fair to uh, discuss. But I think Bill Gates, who you mentioned, is a good example. And however he came to it, he did face some criticism early in his career that he uh, did not seem to be philanthropically inclined. But certainly as um, you know, said that he's going to give away really uh, almost all his fortune uh, to the uh, Gates Foundation. And they've set some very big goals. And I think it's uh, very uh, similar to what he sought to do in business, which was really to, uh, as he said, you know, get a uh, personal computer on everyone's desk. And mm. that really has uh, more or less come about, at least uh, in the wealthier countries where people are able to afford it. And increasingly, even uh, uh, beyond that, as um, uh, personal computers have become very affordable. So now he looks at the world and says, there are 
diseases that we can eradicate completely. Uh, it will take a lot of money uh, to do it and very good organization, good planning. But he's approached it in the same way. And he's pretty much devoted his life to that since sort of backing away from an active role within Microsoft. And so I think that the uh, billionaires, when they get involved in philanthropy, that's very typical that they take on large goals like that, you know, not to say, well, let's give a few dollars here, a few dollars there. Um, but, uh, you know, I think John D. Rockefeller was one who was uh, also criticized uh, being a monopolist in the oil business and so on, and uh, certainly had some rough edges about his uh, b dealings in the business. But once he turned to philanthropy, uh, undertook some very major uh, projects. Um, the uh, it was also involved in eradicating uh, hookworm, which is a very serious disease uh, in the United States at the time. You know, founded uh, the University of Chicago, uh, the Rockefeller University, um, a number of very major institutions. So. Uh, they, um, I think not only for the self-aggrandizement, but to say, well, I, I really want to make a, an important contribution. And uh, so I think that it's part of that same drive that got them to the billionaire status to begin with. Sure. So um, I'm quite pro-wealth and pro-capitalism. It certainly served me well. And when I was a bit more artistic, creative, anti-capitalist, rage against the machine, even somewhat hippie, forgive the stereotypes, I had a different view. But like I've seen the, what, the great gifts that wealth give. Um, do you think then that a commonality of the wealthiest people on the planet is not just an ability to think big, bigger than the rest of people, but almost a delusion of how big their thinking is because everyone you've spoken to so far sounds like at their time when they were making these goals they would have been ridiculed like they'd have been burned at the stake 200 or 300 years ago <laughs> if you look i interviewed uh, someone who's got the only license to um mine on the moon uh, and so he, he's a billionaire and he's basically what he thinks he will be the first person to mine the moon and remove all the radiation so it can be habitable. And that's kind of a bit crazy. <laughs> so is there this line of huge vision and craziness, delusion? Yeah, uh, well, uh, Ted Turner, uh, one of the billionaires uh, in the uh, cable television business where he made his fortune. And uh, it's no, he has made no secret of the fact that he is uh, manic and has to take medication to right. uh, control this. And so I think that probably he does, it has at times gotten carried away, but it has worked for him. Mm. And I think there are other examples uh, like that. And uh, so uh, now you can also point to people who were just crazy and had uh, un totally unreal dream. So I think it, yeah. uh, it, it requires um, the uh, practical ability to say, yes, this is big, this is beyond, uh, almost beyond the scope of imagining, but uh, it, it, I really believe it is achievable. Here's how I can get there. And uh, you have to have a real sense of organization to be able to get there and work through other people. It's not something you can do as a you know, one person show. Um, uh, so, uh, but yes, it is unquestionably some of the ideas that uh, have been out there, well, they've just never been done before. Mm. So, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it requires that. It's, and it's also uh, sometimes seeing the opportunity in something that's uh, quite small. I mean, John Kluge, uh, who made a fortune in uh, the broadcasting business, started out with a little uh, independent station in Washington, D.C. Um, didn't have to pay much for it because no one really saw the potential in it except him. And But he uh, uh, recycled old content, uh, films and television programs that had long gone out of production but were in syndication and uh, actually made that competitive with the network stations in that locality and then built uh, from there. So uh, a lot of times it's seeing the value in an idea. I mean, discounting, uh, discount retailing had been around. As I mentioned, Sam Walton was proud of the fact that he didn't invent anything, but he saw a much bigger potential, the potential to become the largest retailer yeah. uh, in America. Who could would have thought that uh, from the 
you know, tiny little base that he started with, but uh, he he wasn't crazy. He really had the goal. He had learned uh, from his early experience in the retailing business how to set specific goals to achieve, and he continued to achieve them. Now, it helped that they were early in adapting uh, modern you know, data processing at a time when that wasn't widespread in the uh, retailing industry. Uh, so that uh, that made a difference. And uh, but he also had some ideas about um, uh, the uh, sourcing of the uh, products that he sold, was able to acquire them at inexpensive uh, uh, prices and, uh, and, and some specific ways for achieving that. So there were some particular ideas that enabled them to build that uh, gigantic empire. Mm. But being able to envision it was certainly the beginning point. Sure. So a couple of things, three things maybe have just come in my head from that. One is scale, one is timing, and then another is maybe the ability to take rejection. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about scale first. Um, so the billionaire you talked about, Cable, obviously Cable was a, a local, TV was all local and then cable nationalized it. And so the change of local to national creates the scale. And if you think about Walmart being you know, one store and then it's not really so much globalized, but it's certainly nationalized in a huge mm -hmm. country. I can't think of any billionaire who's become so at a small scale. So do you want to talk about scale? Is it something, do you really have to be national, global, or even intergalactic to be able to get to that sort of wealth? Well, uh, or, or at least embrace the fact the challenges that scale brings. Yeah, there are some examples of um, wealth very concentrated in real estate in a particular area, uh, but those I think would be very much the exception. The uh, you know the big fortunes that uh, I uh, I think are recognizable. Um, I mean Richard Branson here in the UK, um, uh, if Michael Bloomberg is uh, who's uh, system, uh, financial services, uh, uh, software system is uh, certainly a global product. And that is an example. There are a lot of terminals. People have the Bloomberg terminal all over the world. Mm -hmm. Many, many. That also started as small from a little storefront in New York City. <coughs> but uh, he, he was able to see that this is something that would be valuable to everyone in the financial field. Uh, some wouldn't be able to afford it, per mm. perhaps, but anyone who could, it would really become necessary. And as it became more widespread, it did become essential. You really couldn't operate in certainly the bond business where I spent a lot of my career. Uh, it just wasn't feasible to uh, compete without having the Bloomberg terminal. So, um, yeah, I think that uh, Taking it to a, a national and international scale is uh, really essential uh, to create the kind of fortunes. People do very well uh, with businesses. Uh, they may own a, um, a few franchise uh, restaurants in a particular area, do quite well, uh, but to really get into the billionaire class, it requires uh, quite a bit of scale. Mm -hmm. Well, the Rousing family, they were, was it, um, they were into packaging. Was it Tetra Pak they owned? It was certainly mm. a huge company. Mm. I mean, think about how many milk bottles, milk cartons, and all those kind of things. They must have sold billions and billions of them. Um, so it, I think sometimes we perceive that a billionaire has to do something amazing or genius or groundbreaking, but sometimes it's a very simple problem scaled to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, and to the next thing. Uh, and that's a uh, timing I, I picked out. So um, you talked a bit about timing, maybe, you know, you, you can't make cable go from local to national until you've got the technology to do that. You can't become a computer wizard if you haven't got a, a supercomputer at the university down the road from where you live. So do you think there's some luck involved or do you think that they spot the timing of when something's going to go big. If you think of e-commerce, Jeff Bezos, but also in China, there's a lot of, well, I say a lot, there are billionaires under 30 in e-commerce on online mm. retail, which of course, that's only a 20 year old industry. So they got in quite early in something that was able to scale. Is it luck? Is it opportunity? Is it getting in a market at the right time? There's no question that uh, in this uh, phase of rapid growth, uh, is really the best time 
uh, to get in to try to become a billionaire. Uh, or uh, another trend was uh, consolidation. So uh, Wayne Huizenga, who built uh, Fortune first in the waste collection business, and then went into uh, what became for a while a very big business of rentals of uh, films uh, in the blockbuster chain, then went into uh, the auto dealership business. And uh, in the, starting in the waste management, that had been a very localized industry. Uh, his family had been in that business on a very uh, local scale, but he saw that the time was coming when uh, you could build up uh, a large uh, enterprise uh, nationwide of these uh, localized units, and of course, you could utilize the truck to collect the uh, waste more efficiently if it was serving several different local communities rather than just the one where it had been concentrated. So there was a whole technique in acquiring the businesses, working with these entrepreneurs who um, became part of this chain. So that was a trend that came along at that particular time. Um, uh, another aspect of timing is uh, buying when things are out of favor. And J. Paul Getty was uh, really famous for that. Uh, I think he somewhat exaggerated his own skill in that, but there's no question. He bought the Pierre Hotel uh, right at the beginning of the Great Depression after it had been uh, built uh, during the uh, great economic boom in the 1920s, and the timing was awful for the originators uh, of, the, of that hotel. He bought it for a quarter of what it, it had been uh, paid to build, and had to wait a while, uh, because during the Depression, of course, it wasn't a time when uh, great fortunes were being made, but mm -hmm. he was able to attract a prominent socialite in New York uh, that made it a popular place to hang out, that helped build the franchise, and eventually uh, made quite a bit of money from that. Um, he was also uh, able to buy into uh, some of the oil properties at times when oil prices were depressed. And that's been the history from the beginning of the oil industry back in the late 19th century, uh, that crude oil goes through wild price swings. Mm. And uh, there, it, it invariably has come back. Maybe there will be a time when fossil fuels will become obsolete and oil prices won't come back, but so far it has worked every time. You have to have the financial staying power in order to, to ride, uh, it, out. You have to ride yeah. it out and uh, take advantage of it. So timing and being able to spot a trend that's coming along is, uh, is very important, mm. absolutely. Great, thank you. So then on to the rejection. <laughs> so obviously a big company of modern times that's brought in a lot of wealth is a company like Uber. Um, and they had to go through a lot of fighting with local authorities and they were quite disliked in a lot of areas. If you think about all oh, the black cabs, this is bigger here in London, hate Uber. Uh, and it, to be fair, quite a lot of billionaires are quite disliked, I think. And mm -hmm. certainly by, and, and misunderstood because they're disliked by people who don't know them. So do you think there's some steeliness of character required? Do you think there's any sort of personality traits that seem to be common in billionaires? Yeah, you absolutely have to have a, th a thick skin to succeed in this. And uh, again, Sam Walton would be a good example because uh, people were not happy with the small retailers being forced out, the mom and pop stores. <clears throat> um, in a lot of cases, the downtown shopping areas, you know, the high street uh, was uh, sort of uh, clear it out because uh, people would want to go to the malls and the Walmart um, or uh, uh, stores out in the sort of some outlying regions. And uh, so that was uh, quite controversial. Uh, uh, John D. Rockefeller, again, w there were also smaller operators. Uh, he made a uh, an overt, very deliberate attempt to monopolize the oil refining business. And of course, that uh, enabled him to squeeze the uh, producers. Uh, so that certainly didn't make him popular. Mm. Uh, and uh, th there is a, um, a response to wealth, a presumption in a lot of cases that, well, it must have been done dishonestly. Uh, don't we need some 
uh, regulation here because the mere fact that uh, people are making a lot of money or these uh, what some would consider obscene amounts of money from it is in itself proof uh, in a lot of people's minds that that's there's something. That's the role of capitalism, isn't it, to make those controls? And, yeah. yeah, and uh, and so uh, the, you, you have to um, expect to encounter some of that uh, response and uh, persevere nonetheless um, and uh, I, I think the uh, you know there are billionaires who have um, uh, gone through that well you know several great fortunes have been made in the private equity business which consists of things uh, such as acquiring family-owned businesses uh, that have been run in a sort of page um, uh, uh, paternalistic sort of way for a number of years and a lot of the uh, profit to be made out of acquiring that and buying it from the original owners is to run it in a uh, stricter business-like way. That may mean longtime employees uh, who are not all that productive but have been kept on because it was a family they felt uh, sort of obligated to the local community. Uh, well, that's sort of out the window uh, and uh, that certainly uh, generates some criticism mm -hmm. from uh, the uh, local people, the community. Um, and uh, there's also a sense that, uh, well, this is uh, creating a, a, a conglomerate that has its fingers in everything. These private equity companies control all these different businesses. Um, and uh, so you may find yourself in Parliament or in Congress being... Uh, uh, vilified as, mm -hmm. as sort of the uh, the wrong face of capitalism, if you will. So you ha certainly have to have the courage of your convictions uh, to do that and to believe that, yes, um, ultimately uh, the market system uh, finding more efficient ways to do things, which will um, put uh, less efficient competitors out of business, mm -hmm. uh, potentially. Um, but you don't succeed as an economy by um, propping up uh, businesses that have become obsolete. You know, that's mm. the nature of capitalism. Uh, attempting to do that can be a very big drag on the economy and yeah. ultimately uh, reduces prosperity to do that. So um, there are unquestionably dislocations uh, when uh, when innovation comes along and when there's disruption. Uh, Ultimately, it winds up better. I think it's important not to be uh, cavalier about this, to understand uh, the effects of that dislocation, to work towards solutions for those who uh, wind up uh, on the wrong end of that. Uh, it doesn't mean that uh, those people all have to be thrown on uh, the, 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 uh, the garbage heap. Mm. Um, uh, uh, but uh, it, it's, it's not uh, productive uh, and not efficient in the, uh, and, and not to the benefit of uh, the uh, population as a whole, ultimately to um, artificially try to prop up those uh, businesses that have become uh, inefficient mm. and, uh, and have sort of had their day and now it's time to move on. And that a lot of that's really driven by technology. Uh, when uh, the technology improves, it is going to make obsolete a lot of the existing uh, productive capacity. Yeah, great. So I'd really like to spend a bit of time trying to get a relatively balanced view. I'm sitting here realizing I'm very pro wealth, money, capitalism, mm -hmm. and I want to challenge my own thoughts. And of course, there are plenty of people who are very anti it. And I'd like this in many ways to be at certain points balanced. So this would be one of those. So could you talk through maybe some of the darker things you found researching billionaires? So maybe where you thought, well, yeah, you know what, maybe they were a bit greedy, or maybe that <laughs> was a monopoly, or maybe they did in this instance break the rules a bit. And you can be specific or generic, it's up to you. And then, let's do that first, and then afterwards we'll do all the great things, whether it's philanthropy or employment or, or innovation. Sure. So let's start with the dark stuff first. Yeah, um, well, I, I guess the example that sticks out most of my mind is uh, an older one, H.L. Uh, Hunt, who uh, at the time when I was young, there were really only, I think, four billionaires uh, H. L. Hunt, Howard Hughes, J. Paul Getty, and Charles MacArthur from the insurance industry, who wasn't anywhere near as well known. Um, Henry Ford had 
been a billionaire but had died a number of years earlier. And uh, uh, Hunt was quite a colorful character uh, in many ways. Um, but uh, one of what really got him started on his path to wealth was that there was a discovery uh, by a wildcatter. These are um, uh, men who had gone out um, with uh, just financed on a shoestring, drilling holes uh, and finding oil occasionally, raising some more money, uh, drilling another one, as and and in new areas, uh, not proven fields, but really trying to make brand new discoveries and quite a chancy sort of business. Well, uh, this fellow had been at it for many years, was already kind of advanced in age, struck it big, and. Um, Hunt got wind of it, uh, realized it was even bigger than this fellow realized, and uh, got him into a hotel room with a bottle of whiskey and <laughs> uh, uh, wound up with the rights to this field, which right. was, uh, and, and I, I don't think that would quite meet my ethical standard. No. Writing the book, I said, well, you're going to have to make the judgments for yourself. I'm not mm -hmm. going to dictate uh, what's right or wrong about this, but I'll show you what uh, these others did. Um, so that uh, was um, uh, you know, an example, I think, of uh, exploitation. Um, and uh, so I, th I think that um, uh, the, the, the surprising thing, though, in, in writing the book, when I started out, I thought there would actually be more of that. That would be a bigger part of it. And I was prepared to say, well, yeah, there's some financial skullduggery here that <laughs> has gone into it. But and, and that was partly, I think, because I had come from the financial industry myself and had seen a lot of you know, hanky panky in financial reporting. I had written a book about that mm. specifically and expected to find more. But uh, I found that by and large, uh, the fortunes had been made uh, through genuine contributions, genuine uh, you know enterprises that really added something that improved upon what had been there before. So I really. Um, can't cite all that many examples. I'm sure uh, most of billionaires have probably been sued at one time or another mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the uh, uh, other parties uh, feel that they got the shorter end of the stick. Certainly, uh, Donald Trump has been sued many times. Um, but, uh, you know, the, uh, I, it, the, again, it didn't wind up predominating in the narratives that I was able to develop. Yeah. That's interesting. And then the upsides. So whether that might be exploring a bit more what philanthropy did or contributions to society or medicine and health. So what were the upsides you found and um, from studying billionaires? Yes, well, I think that the uh, both the businesses themselves that were founded and the um, you know, the philanthropies they got involved with afterward have made important contributions. Um, I think that if we go back again to Henry Ford as uh, uh, probably, I think, for in his time, the lone billion. Now, we have to keep in mind that uh, inflation makes a big difference. So a billion is not what it was at one time. Yeah. So many uh, um, who weren't at a billion dollars uh, in their terms, would certainly be billionaires today. Uh, Ray Kroc, um, uh, McDonald's, I think, as an example. Um, and, uh, you know, I, when I was growing up, it was believed that uh, the restaurant business was not uh, really something you could expand into a nationwide enterprise. You might be able to own two or three restaurants and shuttle back and forth between them to oversee them. But um, most of the cost was in the Labor and there, there really wasn't an economy of scale. And I was doing it in a bigger scale. It wouldn't save you money because they were all uh, the costs were all localized. But he managed to do that. And I can say that um, if you, uh, in contrast to when I was very young, you went to a town that you didn't know, uh, any place you didn't know uh, where would be a good place to eat. The rule of thumb was to look where the, you found police officers eating because they, it was presumed that they were eating lunch every day mm. out at a restaurant and they would know the good places. But you really didn't know for sure. But you could be pretty uh, confident that if you went into McDonald's, you uh, would get 
you know, a clean and uh, well-managed operation and, and certainly at a, an inexpensive price. Uh, so uh, I think that's an example of a, a real uh, revolution in that industry. Um, and by the way, people would, uh, there are, would, uh, would criticize in some cases the uh, you know, the, the nutritional value of McDonald's. I can tell you that they have introduced uh, what, uh, you know, healthier kind of foods, which have not been that well uh, accepted. Yeah. I think they've gone with what the public has demanded. Um, I'm very uh, conscious of what I eat, and I would encourage people to eat healthily, but uh, they, I think, uh, in any business, they have responded to uh, the consumer demand. Um, I think the whole uh, revolution uh, in technology, starting with the uh, personal computer uh, coming along, w w the one uh, real roadblock when the uh, personal computers were developed was the absence of software to make them run. And they were at first very difficult for anyone, but a real devotee, you know, the people who are the real computer nerds today, but were the hobbyists at the time. There wasn't a lot of practical value uh, from personal computers initially, but there was a very hardcore of people who uh, could understand it well enough to use it. But you know, for the average person, it was not really feasible until mm -hmm. the software, the user-friendly software came along uh, from Microsoft, you know, Apple uh, developed products and, and others um, who came along. And that has made a huge difference. I mean, it's hard, I think, for uh, people who are not around before personal computers uh, to understand what life was really like. Uh, yeah. I mean, the ability now with Google, example, to search. I remember when search engines were being developed, there were competitors. Uh, Google ultimately triumphed because it was something you really didn't need a lot of skill to use. You put in Ooh. a word and it searched and everything was there. And I can't tell you in doing research for books uh, how valuable it is. I mean, ultimately, uh, you want to get to uh, articles, you know, get to primary sources, but with the search engines, you can get started, find a few of those articles, and uh, and and then and pull them down, um, you know, download them very easily. Uh, so. It, the, life is completely different uh, th than it was before the uh, advent of those things. And uh, while the uh, U.S. government did provide some of the funding for uh, what became the Internet, and that contribution shouldn't be ignored, uh, I, I don't think that the government by itself would have ultimately developed the internet and certainly not to the state that it's become. I mean, it, it was wonderful to hear, oh, now we have an internet. Uh, initially, you couldn't do a lot with it. It, mm. uh, it was exciting that such a thing existed, but it really took entrepreneurs to say, oh, well, here's an application, here's a site that we could create uh, that would really have a value. And that's that's not really the role of uh, government no. uh, or the, the nonprofit sector so much uh, as entrepreneurs to say, well, I'm going to make a lot of money off this too if it really catches on, but I've thought about what would people really like to be able to achieve, you know, once you have that technology available of the World yeah. Wide Web. And you have to have the incentive of profit to take the risk and do all the work and go through the regulation and obstruction and yeah. competition, and that's the reward. Yeah. Mm. And uh, so, uh, so a lot of good. And then again, uh, with the philanthropy, yes, uh, a lot of uh, great things have come about that. Um, John Paulson, I'm very pleased to know, uh, who's uh, made uh, a, quite a great fortune, billion dollar plus fortune in the uh, hedge fund business. Um, has dedicated uh, very generously to education. And uh, that's an, uh, certainly a, an important resource for, for the economy, but important to individuals as well. And I think that many of the billionaires have been attracted to that idea of making that opportunity available to others. Um, they vary, I pointed out in my book, that not all of them have been rags to riches story. Some of them came from at least uh, middle class or in, in many cases well-to-do families but mm. built much greater fortunes on top of whatever their uh, parents had been able to achieve but I think that in many cases they really feel that it's uh, important for everyone to have the opportunity they had because I think they appreciate the, what capitalism has made possible for them uh, but they know that without the education that they received they would not have been able to uh, exploit 
those opportunities. And I think they feel a great sense of injustice that we haven't reached the stage where everyone uh, has the educational opportunity, everyone who has the, uh, the mind and the uh, discipline uh, and the ambition to achieve that um, doesn't have the same opportunity that they had. And so uh, providing scholarships uh, to students to be able to uh, attend uh, top universities that they can uh, aspire to. They have the uh, the talent, but not necessarily the means to achieve. Is a um, uh, is a, a cause that uh, that many identify with. And I know this myself. Uh, you know, uh, I've been fortunate to be able to endow a couple of scholarships at uh, the university I attended, and in talking with many classmates, as they're um, thinking about contributing to the universities. That's the cause, particularly the scholarships of being able to enable others to uh, achieve uh, and uh, capitalize on their uh, native uh, abilities is something that really resonates, mm. and I think with many of the billionaires as well. Mm. So picking out a couple of things you said, like tracking things mm. like uh, Walmart, Google, and if you add Amazon into the mix, I think a lot of people don't understand these people who end up becoming billionaires take huge risks, their own personal fortune risks, not mm -hmm. public sector, but private sector personal fortune risks, and ultimately create things, and I'm trying to think of any that don't, certainly in oil, internet, e-commerce, they, they make things that are easier, faster, better, and more convenient for us. And of course, there's always going to be a cost, which is less convenient, maybe mum and pop shops, than more convenient Walmarts, i.e. price, or everything under one roof. Amazon, it does make me chuckle that people who <laughs> complain about how little Amazon pay in tax and they do all their shopping on Amazon. Yeah. But I mean, how much easier has Amazon made our life? So this, is there yeah. this convenience factor? They, they, oh, they, yes. yeah, I would yeah. go even beyond convenience. Please. I mean, <clears throat> I have a friend who um, happens to be very much to the left politically. Uh, I'm very fond of, um, but she has said that in her little town in New England, uh, Walmart is the one store where she feels people of low incomes are treated with respect and considered important. They, mm -hmm. they value them coming to their stores and has certainly made many things that would not be affordable uh, within the reach of uh, people of low incomes. And by the way, um, has uh, had a very measurable impact on the overall uh, gross domestic product mm -hmm. of the United States by uh, uh, bringing in, uh, and a lot of it's imported from China, another issue that has become quite controversial, but personally I believe that's very important uh, to uh, take advantage of com uh, uh, global trade. Uh, I know there currently there's a big backlash against that, a move toward protectionism in the United States, but and Brexit uh, in the UK, and, and <laughs> in the UK, yes. Um, uh, to me, I, I, I have yet to find an economist outside of the administration in the United States who doesn't believe that uh, global uh, international trade is a benefit. Uh, uh, across the yeah. board. And pretty uh, much everyone uh, in England who runs a business or has a private sector entrepreneurial business focus thinks we should not exit. No. Yeah. And uh, so, the, the, so uh, Walmart, by doing that, bringing in inexpensive goods, uh, has had a, a, a real, really a positive impact on the US GDP. Um, and really, any enterprise that has improved productivity has done that. Thanks I, to scale. Scale increases productivity, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. And uh, I grew up in Detroit, so I was very conscious and actually went to a high school named after Henry Ford. Mm. Uh, so it was very, very much a part of my upbringing and knowledge. And there are a lot of uh, valid criticisms of Henry Ford uh, uh, outside of the business uh, spectrum. But uh, by introducing the assembly line, now this was had been developed in the meat packing industry, but he brought it into the auto industry, reduced the cost of an automobile by about 80% within a, just a few years by doing this. And uh, that put uh, automobiles, which had been a luxury item, only for the wealthy, only those who had owned carriages before, which was not the average working person. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, 
brought, made that affordable uh, as late as, um, I think in the 1960s, Nikita Khrushchev, uh, who was the premier of the Soviet Union, came to the United States and visited an auto plant and saw the parking lot and said, who do those cars belong to? And he said, those belong to the workers here. And he didn't believe it. <laughs> said, that's, that's impossible. How can the average working person afford to own his own automobile? Yeah. But this was something that was made possible by uh, Ford and other uh, innovators in the auto industry uh, who made that affordable. And one of the outcomes of introducing the assembly line was unfortunately, it was somewhat monotonous work. And, uh, and the turnover rate of the uh, workforce increased as a result of that. So what Henry Ford did is what is that he introduced a $5 a day wage, which was twice the going rate mm -hmm. at the time. And he was criticized. People said, this is socialism. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, he, but, and he actually was forced out of the original company that he created because he wanted to raise the wages of the workers. And they said, oh, they, this is not a charitable institution. But he had the vision to see that if you had a happy uh, and well-paid workforce and didn't have a lot of turnover, that would really make the enterprise more successful. Mm. Um, so uh, a lot of uh, good things came out of that. And, uh, and eventually, because he raised the wages, that did uh, eventually force others to, uh, uh, to compete and uh, raise their wages as well. It didn't happen immediately. For a long time, he was well above the uh, average manufacturing uh, wage. But it wound up, wound up making a lot of difference. So I think there are many uh, good that uh, you can point out, to, even before you get to philanthropy, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, really came through the, uh, you know, I, I like to call the free enterprise system. People mm -hmm. are not bashful at calling it capitalism nowadays. Uh, but I think that, in many people's minds, has a, uh, an unsavory uh, taste to it. But the idea that, yes, a somewhat we, free enterprises. <laughs> yeah, we don't. Yeah, we don't have completely uh, unbridled yeah. uh, free enterprise. And uh, there, and and, and uh, by the way, I wrote another book that uh, discussed this and said, yes, when you have a genuine market failure, that is, you should have uh, some intervention by the yes. government. Do it. The difference between liberals and conservatives in the United States is how many market failures are there out there, really. What I found in doing the research on that book, which is called Unwarranted Intrusions, um, was that uh, many subsidies would be introduced, often by uh, capitalists themselves who said, well, if I can get government to support me, uh, that's better than having to actually go out and uh, compete. Maybe I can get them to uh, suppress my competitors by putting in a lot of regulations that will be hard for the smaller competitors to uh, comply with. Mm -hmm. And But those subsidies would get introduced and there would be an alleged market failure to justify it. And then what I found a pattern was that when that market failure was discredited and shown to be false, they would come up with another uh, alleged market failure to continue mm. that subsidy. And many of these subsidies have continued for decades and decades without any uh, justification and uh, as great drags on the economy. Mm. So um, when I talk about free enterprise, um, I'm talking about genuine free enterprise, not uh, a friend of mine, Gene Epstein, who is the former economics editor of Barron's uh, financial publication in the United States said that uh, he was opposed to what he calls capitalism or crony capitalism and uh, uh, that's uh, you know that's not to be uh, defended any more than uh, socialistic schemes or anything, anything else is uh, if you're for free enterprise it should be yes genuinely going out competing and running the risk of going broke because you don't have the government to backstop you mm. so Again, so many questions. We've actually only done question one on my list, so this is, <laughs> but this is this is great. So um, let's move on from the traits of billionaires because that's kind of been the theme of our discussion yeah. so far. We may open yeah. that loop again. Um, I'd like to talk a bit more about you, your book, yeah. um, which really inspired me. Um, it's also for me. This is also like a history lesson because mm -hmm. you haven't yet mentioned any modern billionaires. You're very well knowledgeable on all the billionaires you've studied. So I just had a couple of ideas. I wonder if you could ever write how to be a young billionaire <laughs> or how to be a modern billionaire. <coughs> um, well, yeah. I, I, if I were to do a new edition, which I've shied away from for a variety of reasons, but what are, they, uh, what are those reasons? If you don't mind me. Well, asking. I think that um, the, you know the story 
is there the uh, you can learn from the billionaires going back uh, to the past to the present partly it's just that I've been preoccupied with other projects and uh, mostly interested in doing new things. Mm. The, my book, Financial Statement Analysis, uh, needs to be updated. I'm working on a fifth edition of that with my co-author, Fernando Alvarez. Um, but uh, for the most part, I've, I've wanted to go on to new things rather than yeah. constantly revisit old territories. But there are some differences. Um, you mentioned the phrase young billionaire. That didn't really exist no. in the past. Yeah, what were um, they on, about 60, give or take? Um, well, yeah, they, I, well, uh, I think that John D. Rockefeller actually retired from the oil business at uh, around the age of 40. Wow. Uh, he did go on to make another fortune in the iron mining business, but um, that was quite the exception. Uh, most of them took a long time to get to a billion. Uh, they were well on the way, perhaps in the 30s, but uh, it took a long time. So Mark Zuckerberg uh, uh, at Facebook is quite unusual uh, compared, and that would that would be the difference if I were right now. There's a, no. there's a yeah. chap in China, I forget his name, wasn't he 25 year old billionaire? Mm -hmm. It's yeah. becoming more common. Is that because of technology speeding everything up or is that because of inflation? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, well, inflation is played a role to get the number of a billion, but to create a, a fortune on that scale, even let's say a, a mere hundred billion dollars, yeah. hundred million dollars today, uh, I say somewhat facetiously. Um, yeah, technology, uh, you know, it really has developed at a pace. It's not a matter yeah. of well, I've been in business doing the same thing, growing it for years and years, but rather I had an idea, it caught on. Uh, we now have. Uh, must a billion be fiber, subscribers. Fiber optics must have helped get, to get information globally really quickly that must yeah. have been a big thing yeah absolutely yeah uh, but you know having something like the internet and saying well I have an application I have a website there's a particular need people are interested in dating they're interested in uh, learning about certain topics uh, they're interested in buying and selling merchandise online directly uh, to other buyers and sellers uh, all those ideas are something that can be expanded because of the internet much more rapidly yeah. than in the past. Rather than saying, well, we're going to open 10 new stores this year, next year we'll open 20 stores, and eventually we'll have 1,000 stores. Um, no, you don't need to go no. through all that steps now. those steps nowadays. So that would be the biggest difference if I were to come out with a revised edition today. Yeah. Okay, so how long ago did you write How to Be a Billionaire? Uh, that was in 2000. Right, it's almost 20 years old. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, again, I think the, the stories that are in there are timeless and oh, continue are, to, yeah. to be learned from. But yeah, there are some new wrinkles that mm. uh, yeah, like would come said, in I'll, for it. I almost okay, feel today. like it owns its own place in history because, you know, I've probably studied more modern billionaires. But because I, I mean, some of those, like Bill Gates was modern when, when yeah, you wrote that's the right. book, and that's now right. he's almost. Um, Maybe, He's a veteran. maybe. <laughs> I, I would look. I would love. In, I'm just chatting randomly now, but I, I would definitely love to see a how to be a young billionaire. Or a, twenty years sounds like a good time to have another edition or a follow yeah. on. Yeah. Um, anyway, I'm not here to say. Well, you went my appetite for it as we speak. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Bill Gates, you know, did, did uh, get started uh, fairly young. Then uh, in, again, I think that was beginning of. Uh, it becoming more feasible within a relatively short time. It di again, didn't happen overnight. Mm. It worked very hard, had some setbacks initially. Um, but uh, I like to say uh, he was actually at college when I was. I didn't know him. He was spending a lot of his time uh, playing poker and hanging out in the Science Center, which didn't happen to be my uh, area particularly. Um, but I always said that if he had just cut me in for a very small percentage, <laughs> I would have been able to find all the bugs in his uh, yeah. programs because I seem to find if, if I had a nickel for every time someone has said to me, I've been doing IT for 20 years and I've never encountered this problem before, <laughs> but it has only happened to Marty Fridzen. Uh, so I, I felt that, uh, you know, think how successful Bill Gates could have been if he had you know, cut me in for a small yeah. piece and I had helped him at that early stage. But uh, it didn't work out that be. way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a small percentage would have gone a long yeah, way. Yeah. Uh, so, but, yeah. why did you write the book? What, what was your motivation and drive behind writing the book? 
Well, I thought there was a story that really hadn't been told. There were stories about great business leaders, but many of them, although they were well known in their own right and certainly very successful, um, had worked, uh, perhaps got a share of uh, business and become quite wealthy, but they hadn't become billionaires. And there were also story uh, books about uh, great geniuses, uh, inventors, who had uh, made tremendous contributions. But I noticed that many of them, uh, Thomas Edison kind of being an exception, who uh, became uh, pretty wealthy. Of course, he invented a number of things and not just uh, one big one. But for the most part, um, those individuals had not become fabulously wealthy either. And when I started to look into it, I realized that the billionaires, for the most part, hadn't been completely uh, original in their ideas, but again, often recognized there was an idea that was out there, uh, but could be exploited on a much larger scale, Steve much Jobs, more successfully. Steve Jobs famous for that today. You know, yeah, that. absolutely. And so, um, so I thought that that really was a missing piece. Uh, there wasn't really a book out there like that. Mm. And um, and I found that yes, when I started looking into it, they had certain techniques, the individual who was taking it large risk, was also retaining uh, the bulk of the equity. I mean, Bill Gates didn't give the way the company to uh, venture capitalists. Mm -hmm. uh, he, uh, uh, Steve Ballmer also owned a significant piece of it, Paul Allen, uh, but it wasn't. Um, this is you know, a huge point, yeah, I think, yeah, a yeah. huge point. I spoke to someone who had a very, very famous TV show in the 90s, it's a comedian, and he only owned 6% equity in the show. All the, 94% you know, of the revenue is distributed to everybody mm -hmm. else. I've interviewed reality TV stars, reality pop stars, and mm -hmm. you know people are in these manufactured bands and they get royalty checks for pence and they own like very small percent of their own IP. Yeah. So is it a common trait that they own a good amount of equity of these assets? That's that's generally the case that uh, they, now they may have had to borrow a lot in order to do that and borrowing is an essential, uh, you know, inherently risky. Mm. Uh, you have the debts to pay. You may not have the revenues coming in yeah. quite on a steady basis, but the interest payments mm. are pretty much a regularly scheduled thing that you have to meet. So you run the risk of going broke, um, being undercapitalized, uh, and uh, so it's not easy to retain the equities, particularly as the enterprise is growing. Um, there may be some value, and some of them, I think, did wisely bring employees, particularly key employees, in some cases of very broad-based employees, into equity ownership. Many millionaires were uh, created. Why do you uh, think that was so. wise? Is it because it saves on paying extra, or is it because it gets the staff vested and incentivized into the company, or both? I think both, yeah. uh, but the, the second part is certainly a big part of it. You uh, have... Uh, you know, very loyal employees as a result of that. They have a stake in the business. Uh, what, you know, the people who are going to work the hardest generally are the owners of the business. Uh, employees are uh, going to tend to say, well, I've done my part. It's five o'clock, yeah. time for me to go home. Uh, where as an owner of the business doesn't get to do that. It, even if it's a small business, they have to be there. They may have to be there on holidays. Uh, they may have to leave uh, some family uh, uh, gathering because there's an emergency that they have to deal with. And um, the, you know, the employees are inherently not gonna be as dedicated as that. On the other hand, if they have a stake, I've been very fortunate uh, to have equity stakes in companies I've worked for. I've been uh, and, and am currently uh, an owner of a business. And it, it certainly gives you a different attitude about that. So um, a, uh, a well thought out uh, employee stock ownership plan uh, or bringing in partners who can make a great contribution and giving them a significant stake in the business, you know, having a lot of upside uh, really can be a very wise business policy. Great, and let's go before your book. I'm just very grateful you wrote that book. Um, before that book, um, for those people who don't know so much about your journey, Marty, and obviously your great focus on um, financial analysis and all of the things that you do. So can you just let us know sort of maybe a bit of your journey of how you became to, to specialize in what you do specialize in? 
I was in uh, business school and had worked in summers uh, selling books door to door. Uh, I'm very proud of the fact that I recruited a fellow who is now the president of that company wow. uh, called Southwestern Company based in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, but out of that, I got interested in business. I had been thinking of law as a career, but uh, concluded that uh, business, what I liked about it was it was very inductive rather than deductive. You know, law you had in the United States, a constitution, you have the common law system. You were sort of deducing from that what the application of a particular case might be. Very interesting. I still find that interesting in the process, but I was more interested in this inductive process. You know, there are no uh, solutions out there in business. You have to sort of figure it out. Everything is a new, uh, uh, a new challenge. And it may be an entirely new business where no one knows what the roadmap is. So I found that very exciting. Um, went to business school and uh, was looking really more at the manufacturing. We studied at, my, at Harvard Business School very much the case study method. And many of the cases were based on manufacturing companies. And that's sort of how I was oriented to think. But I got an invitation based on my sales experience to interview with a Wall Street firm. It was the furthest thing from my mind. <coughs> A classmate of mine um, by the name of Bruce Morrow, I'll be forever indebted, said, well, you should go on this interview. You never know uh, when you might find out. So I said, all right, well, the company uh, was called Mitchell Hutchins. Uh, it's, it's long since been absorbed by Payne Weber, which was then absorbed by UBS. <laughs> But um, they said, well, if you have another interview in New York, uh, we'll pay half of the cost for you to come here. So uh, I did. I had uh, met a girl who lived in uh, near New York and um, uh, arranged to get together to have dinner with her. She came to the city and um, I didn't know any hotels. Uh, so I stayed at a place called the Park Sheraton, which turned out to be a magnificent townhouse that had been turned into a hotel. And uh, I said, well, I don't know any restaurants in New York, but they ha seem to have a restaurant at the hotel. We uh, went in, she looked at the magnificent crystal chandeliers and said, oh my gosh, is this what happens when you work on Wall Street? <laughs> <laughs> so my attitude changed immediately. Yeah. I became very serious about this interview mm. and <laughs> um, fortunately hit it off quite well. I think with the interviewers, they uh, made me an offer and I, I thought to myself, well, I'll have other opportunities to do some of these other things uh, that, I have, uh, that I have offers from, but this could be my only chance chance to come to work on Wall Street. And I liked the company. It was a more laid back kind of place, not quite the um, uh, you know, pinstripe, you know, gray suits that I'd expected and uh, uh, very friendly place and very um, intellectually exciting because uh, Mitchell Hutchins was known as a leader in research. And um, and I got to know some of those analysts who were very smart, and it was exciting. We used to have a, a meeting on Monday morning, and people asked me, what's the be most exciting time of the week for you? And I said, Monday morning. They said, oh, that's the worst time <laughs> for me. I hate you know, finishing the weekend and having to go to work. I said, but these meetings, we, they would have coffee and donuts, and I'd get to listen to these very smart analysts talk about their stocks and about the economy. And so on, and I, I loved that. And uh, I started out trading corporate bonds and um, uh, enjoyed that very much. Uh, it was, uh, I found very entrepreneurial, developing a network of uh, uh, regional dealers that we sort of acted as a distributor uh, toward and learned how to value the different bonds. And then the fellow who had originally hired me, uh, his name is Jack Rifkin, who I owe so much to. He's unfortunately passed on in the last couple of years. But uh, after Mitchell Hutchins was acquired by Payne Weber, he went with them. Our group uh, split out, went with another uh, company. But Jack then uh, uh, contacted me and said, well, you know, I think you would do really well in research. Uh, that was quite a change. But I said, well, it would be a good idea to diversify my experience, learn a different part of the business. Um, I had no real experience uh, in doing that, had learned a little bit. Uh, ha had I foreseen this, I would have taken some courses that I didn't take in business school about mm -hmm. financial analysis. But uh, I uh, became part of a team headed uh, by another fellow who unfortunately has also passed on named Russ Fraser. Um, 
And uh, I said, well, how, how do you uh, do this? How do you figure out these companies? He said, well, here is a loose leaf notebook. <laughs> I don't know if anyone even knows what a loose leaf notebook is nowadays, but he said, um, in here are financial ratios for the different companies at the different uh, ratings of the rating agencies and uh, classified by the different industries so you can get an idea what uh, the averages are, what a company would be that would be better than average within its industry or within its rating category. And um, it was ve a very systematic approach and I just started one by one. I had to follow about 130 companies, which is wow. absurd mm. uh, to believe that you'd be able to be on top of those. But just before I got there, uh, five analysts had left for a rival company and there was a um uh, what they call the back office crisis, which was uh, a, a sort of an overload of the trading volume uh, relative to the very primitive uh, computer capabilities that they had at the time. And uh, Payne Weber had unfortunately merged with another company that was apparently the only company that didn't have a compatible computer system with theirs. And as they were trying to get that reconciled, this back office crisis hit, and Payne Weber was technically insolvent because it, uh, the unmatched trades were deducted from your net capital and Payne Weber was technically insolvent, but the regulators decided it would be bad to have them go under and create a panic. So, but the upshot of this was that they were unable to uh, hire uh, uh, to any great extent. So I had to replace the five analysts who had left. Mm. And so I had a very large uh, universe, but I followed them in a very systematic way. Every day would write up another company and get through them all uh, in about a six month period and then start over again. Um, and uh, and then started to learn more about the industry you know, beyond following individual companies or a particular industry, but some of the broader things was, um, did a, a stint at a couple of other companies and then uh, it became the head of the bond research group at Morgan Stanley, a very fine investment bank, mm -hmm. and later at Merrill Lynch. And uh, as it went, went on, um, I, I wound up uh, being asked to write a chapter in a book about financial statement analysis uh, of a friend of mine, uh, Ed Altman, was the editor of that series, and uh, the gentleman who had written the book, uh, that, that chapter in the previous uh, edition had died, so uh, Ed asked me if I would do that. It was the biggest project by far that I had taken on to write a whole chapter in a book. Um, but when I got through with that, the uh, editor of, uh, at the, of the series at uh, Wiley, uh, the publishing company, named Carl Weber said, well, how would you like to turn that into a book? And I foolishly said yes, <laughs> not realizing how, quite how uh, big a job it would be. And um, I uh, spent evenings writing that book. And um, unfortunately, our second child had been born, who was a boy. And for those of you who hadn't had that experience, boys tend to be somewhat more colicky than girls. So he spent a lot of that time screaming uh, while I was trying to write the book. So that turned out to be a challenge. But I eventually got it done. And uh, that book is, is now in its fifth edition. Uh, and uh, once I got through with that, Carl said to me, well, what's your next book going to be about? Which I hadn't thought about, really, but uh, went on and uh, continued writing. And then eventually, the idea of writing How to Be a Billionaire came to me, although it didn't start out quite uh, with, it didn't start out with that title mm -hmm. and not quite the concept that I wound up uh, following. But uh, I, I found that the interesting part of it was, well, what were the techniques that these individuals used that enabled them to achieve what so few uh, had been able to uh, at that time? Sure. Great. Wow. Fascinating. Can we have a one minute break? Yeah. Um, yeah, and then we'll maybe go into some quicker fire questions. Mm -hmm. um, I need a unplug the microphone kind of break. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and let me see. I think I had one message while we were. Okay, sure. Going, so, so let me I'll just. just <coughs> the microphone's unplugged, so you chaps are right. Yeah. Do you know what the time is? Just in here. Yeah, so let me. Do a friend, right? Yeah, I'll just literally be there, come back, and then we'll do a quick fire. Oh, these. Are Um, I wonder if I could just take a, a rest and break. Yes, yeah, reminded me of all the things I am. Um, I read in the book, what nearly twelve years ago. It's like a history lesson, because a lot of people don't so much talk about the um, 
the older billionaires, obviously with all these young billionaires that there are now, and everyone knows about Jeff Bezos and everyone talks about Steve Jobs in business, but um, I think one thing you learn studying billionaires is that um, history tends to repeat itself, cycles tend to repeat itself, people tend to capitalise on opportunities that they didn't design, they often just re-innovated from something that was existing but hadn't been scaled or um, wasn't functioning to its best ability or wasn't in the right function or um, just didn't reach many people. Um, so whether it's Sam Walton taking one small shop and making it national or um, oil which obviously gl became global um, and now you're seeing the pattern repeat again with the internet of fibre optics and the speed of light has just accelerated the reach that entrepreneurs have and business owners have which means they can accumulate wealth quicker because the faster you can get out to people, the quicker you can solve their problems. When you read a book that you really like, you hold the author in very high regard, like a deity. Uh, and so to meet him and speak to him and see that he's well-researched, well-educated, a normal, ordinary, friendly, personable chap as well, that's kind of a fun experience to go through, yeah? Fantastic. All right, you ready? Yeah. yeah. Uh, just out of curious, how, how long does, um, uh, when, when you do the final podcast, how long does that? Uh, we usually put it out pretty much unedited form. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, oh. seems to be the content style that people favor nowadays. Oh, really? Well, because it's honest. You, if, you, if there's nothing cut out, then there's, there's nothing that could have been there that's been taken yeah. out. And, and no, putting in the question after to make the answer. Exactly, exactly. yeah. Sound, you, you, sound worse than it was. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> I mean, a lot of people are edited, aren't they? And in a way that, that they didn't intend to answer the question or they're set up. Yeah. yeah um, and obviously, hopefully you feel that that's not my ulterior motive. Oh, no, 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 I, it's just, no, no It's just a subject not. I'm fascinated about. So. Sure. I'll tell you what would be good to do now, Marty, to okay. respect your time and to get a bit of sort of um, a move towards the end is to, to maybe do some short answers. Okay. So I'll, um, yeah, I'll, let me, yeah, let me try to maybe keep it to a minute. Yeah, as, uh, I just think, it, I mean, we like to um, move the podcast towards the end yeah. by doing what we call the quick fire. doesn't mean you have to rush the answer, but... Mm -hmm. um, so, and almost like, because we can summarise some of the things we've discussed. So... Um, was there a billionaire of yours that you favoured? You thought, he's the guy I'd like to, inspired me, of all the ones you studied? Well, there were uh, so many, and I really admired all of those in their own ways that I studied. I think in some ways, uh, Ross Perot really appealed to me personally. He um, was a real innovator in the uh, data processing. Uh, you know, brought that to uh, enterprises and even to government to uh, make things more efficient. And I think also had a, um, uh, a really good attitude toward people. I, one of the stories he told was during the Depression, uh, his mother uh, you know, pointing to a uh, hobo, uh, you know, someone a tramp, someone who lost his job, and who she did help, and saying uh, his circumstances are just different. He's not any different from us. And you know, when uh, Ross Pro ran a company and said that um, uh, you know, some of the big companies, the idea would be to see a snake and say, let's have a committee to study snakes and decide what to do. And, you know, at his company, we kill the snake. Um, and uh, so there were a lot of things. I think he was uh, a very genuine person that uh, I think just at a personal level really appealed to me there. Um, I think Sam Walton was someone that I also uh, admired and, and felt had a, a real humanity to him that I personally uh, identified mm. with. Great. So could we summarize some defining traits of billionaires? Um, I think we talked about focus. I think we talked about scale. Um, I think we talked about um, maybe a, an ability to deal with challenge and uh, resistance from lots of people, um, timing, opportunity. So we've discussed those. Are there any others you'd add, defining traits of billionaires? 
Yeah, I think the willingness to take large risks is important. Uh, the uh, These were not individuals. I m uh, mentioned Kirk Krikorian as an outstanding example, but I think the uh, Lawrence Tisch would be another who really put it on the line after having accumulate a lot of wealth, certainly a level that m most people would be quite satisfied with <laughs> and start, start to wonder, well, how can I spend all this money? Mm -hmm. But uh, was willing to uh, take a, a risk even at that stage. You know, it's, yeah. not, it's one thing to take risk when you have nothing to lose, mm -hmm. but when you have right. a lot and say, well, I'm going to uh, take out a loan on what I've accumulated already, thinking I can make even more. So that, I think, would be a one to put up uh, yeah. very high on the list. Mm -hmm. I think we didn't discuss it, but it sounded like you'd referred to it a few times. Patience. It sounded like you said, you know, it doesn't. T it's not overnight. It takes time. And obviously, whilst that's got shorter now, maybe because of technology, is that a key element? Do you think that longer term view and the patience of thinking? Yeah, and I think that going hand in hand with that is the ability to accept setbacks, uh, because. Uh, it's not only that it doesn't come overnight, but it comes after uh, many attempts, uh, sort of paths that don't work out, and it's easy to get discouraged. Um, but it may be that the enterprise that ultimately becomes successful is not really the direction you were going in initially, and uh, the uh, opportunities to arise may come from uh, unexpected quarters. I think that was certainly the case with Microsoft. They had a very clear direction they wanted to go in terms of making software uh, available on a wider scale. And, and uh, But the uh, system that really got them going, uh, the QDOS system was something that they didn't know about when they started out. They really sort of happened upon it. And uh, that, uh, so I think that being flexible and mm. patient in saying, well, yeah, yes, we're, we're on a path, we're determined to go that way, but if it isn't working out, being able to say, well, don't keep going down a path that's not going to work ultimately, but there's a slight veering off in another direction that has much more potential, mm. and we have to be uh, not stubborn. Determined is one thing, but pig-headed is not the way to sure. go. Sure, sure. Great. What's the best advice you've ever received? Now, by the way, a couple of these questions here, I think, are, are pretty lame questions on my part. Mm -hmm. But each time I ask them, I, I get pretty good answers. So don't judge my questions too much. Um, best advice you've ever received? Yeah, I think the uh, best advice I ever received was to explore the direction I ultimately took uh, going to Wall Street, uh, which was so far, I, I can tell you, that was absolutely not uh, what I was thinking at all, not the way I envisioned my life going. <clears throat> and often that is the best advice to uh, really try something that's just very far removed from what yeah. you had in mind. Right. And then the worst advice you ever received, if you can remember it. <laughs> well, I was actually advised not to go to Wall Street because I was specifically going to work in the bond department. And uh, at the time, it had uh, been a period when um, uh, interest rates had gone down shortly before that. And the fellow who was telling me this didn't quite understand that that actually is a very good thing for the bond business because interest rates coming down uh, means that bond prices are going up. So the first uh, year or two that I was in the business, uh, we did phenomenally well. Um, and uh, it was actually a very good time. And I laugh about it now. I'm still very friendly with this mm -hmm. fellow who had given me this advice. But uh, fortunately, I had the wit or luck not to follow that advice. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, is there one particular thing you feel strongly that's kind of wrong with the world or something that you want to change? Uh, I think that uh, what I would change if I had a magic wand is to level the playing field for opportunity. Uh, something I remember discussing in uh, Business Wife and I've spoken about with my wife, you know, she likes to say that uh, one idea is uh, of equality is that all the outcomes are equal. 
uh, a better idea of it is that the opportunities are all equal. And that's not an easy thing to achieve. Uh, I think the United States is really built on that idea. Uh, but I, it, could I say that we are achieving that ideal currently? Unfortunately, we still have more poverty than we should as a wealthy nation. Uh, the education is not at a level that it should be. We should be as one of the wealthiest nations, certainly up at the level of Finland and South Korea, which are considered the best at the uh, uh, primary school level. No reason why we can't achieve that. The, the biggest obstacle to it is the uh, poverty level uh, of students. We have schools that very much uh, perform at the level of the Finnish schools. Not all of them do, but there's no reason why they shouldn't all. But uh, when you have 30% uh, of the students below the poverty line, it's just very difficult to achieve that, even with very dedicated teachers. Yeah. So that's the thing that... It, I would like most to change, but I know having studied the issue and looked at people who, with very good intentions, have gone off with the wrong ideas about how to reform the school system, that it's something that there's not a silver bullet. There's mm -hmm. just a lot of things that need to be done to, uh, to achieve that. Sure. Okay, thank you. So finally then, um, I have two podcasts, and uh, I've been sitting here through this thinking, which one shall I publish publish this episode on and I'm going to publish it on both because I've enjoyed it so much. Okay. Um, so one podcast is called Money and obviously that's obvious to fit and another one's called The Disruptive Entrepreneur which is the slightly bigger podcast at the moment. So um, that word disruptive I always like to ask everyone I interview what does the word disruptive mean to you? Well it's a great question and it's a great word. I think in most contexts it's viewed as a negative. Uh, you know, things are going along in a nice, even keel, and here's someone who's disrupting things. And you know, <laughs> think of the other words that have rupt in them. There, and I've studied this. There are a, a very small number in the English language: corrupt, interrupt, abrupt, abrupt, yeah. bankrupt. <laughs> <clears throat> um, they're generally not positive words. Mm. But it's very interesting to me that in the business context, disrupt has become a highly positive. Uh, word and what it really is about is an idea that's been around really since the beginning of the industrial revolution to say there's a better way to do things we can make things cheaper we can make them better um, and uh, we can make them available to a larger uh, portion of the population but it's going to require uh, changing things the way things are done. And change is not something that comes easily to most people. I can't uh, boast of being the most receptive of change to myself. I've had to train myself really to be receptive to change. But ultimately, if you think about it intellectually, say, yes, that's the better thing. We, we have to be ready to adapt and to change. And so that's what it means to me is bringing better things to better people, more uh, inexpensively, um, but realizing we'll have to break some things along the way to get there. Sure. Thank you. So I don't want to finish yet without giving everyone listening the opportunity to follow you or, um, you know, is there one or two of your books that you think would be most interesting to the readers? Obviously, we've talked a lot about How to Billionaire. I can't recommend that enough. Mm -hmm. Is that available on audio? Uh, yes, there is an audio version of it right. uh, that was done. And, um, is that actually, unaudible? Because I, I, I couldn't find that when I looked. Okay, well, um, perhaps we're in the UK. Uh, yeah, um, it's uh, Conan Nightingale is the oh, okay. publisher of right, that, yeah. so that may help to track okay, it down, right. C-O-N-A-N-T, yeah. Nightingale. Um, Earl Nightingale, by the way, was the name behind that. was a great motivational mm. speaker, um, and they, they do a lot of... Uh, audiobooks that yeah. are, are highly inspirational. Um, the, uh, if you're particularly interested in the, uh, the stock market, although it's uh, very U.S. oriented, I think that uh, it, it provides some insight. A book called It Was a Very Good Year, uh, which looked at the 10 best years in the stock market in the 20th century in the U.S. and look for the uh, common thread so they would yeah. be able to recognize when it's coming again. Um, the, I mentioned the financial statement analysis book, which has some, I, I think, very valuable case studies on 
how companies have been able to be deceptive. Uh, some of those are from the UK, uh, Europe, and elsewhere. Um, so it's not uh, by any means uh, only uh, uh, applicable in one country. Um, so I think that that's well worth uh, studying and has been adopted by some, uh, some investment organizations who use it as a training book mm. for wow. their analysts coming in. Do you do any social media? Do you make any commentary online? I do uh, comment on Twitter, uh, also on Forbes.com. Uh, with other responsibilities, I don't post as frequently as uh, uh, many others do yeah. uh, who really sort of make a career out of it. But those are the, uh, 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 the main ones that I've used, and I try to bring attention, particularly through uh, Twitter and LinkedIn, to uh, works I publish elsewhere that are available mm. online. And is it, is it Martin Fridson or Marty Fridson, where, if we were to search? Um, yeah, Martin Fridson uh, would be the yeah. best way to search for me, yes. Great. Well, Marty, thanks a lot for spending your time. I don't want to take you up anymore because I know you've got family to see. Uh, but I've really enjoyed this. Yes, I have Should as well. Thank you so the much. Camera have as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, really enjoyed meeting you, and thank you. and thanks to both of you. Uh, I know you've been uh, very hard. It must have been, uh, it seems to me it must be tremendously fatiguing to uh, <laughs> yeah. film for quite They've as long these, as that. Fun. These things are good, aren't they? Yeah. Your, your shoulders will go in a bit, won't they? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I need to go to the gym more. Yeah.